Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the world of marine algae. As always, I'll start by reminding people I am an enthusiast, not an expert on seaweed. And as an enthusiast, I'm just hoping that sharing my enthusiasm will nudge people into doing things to look after our world, not just the seaweed, but everything else. Now, psychomania. The 19th century was a manic time, a crazy time. There was Torido mania. That's a craze for collecting ferns. There was always, there was a railway mania and that made and lost huge fortunes for some people. You know, there was even a craze for kaleidoscopes and in the 1890s, there was a craze for creating headless photos. There are hundreds of these that you can find. Some of them look most bizarre. Well, I suppose all of them look bizarre. And the passion for collecting natural objects included seaweed. People who live near the coast or people who visited seaside resorts to take the air would collect seaweed. And some of them would press it and compile albums. This one was compiled in Ilfracoon and it's got all sorts of things in it. It was actually compiled by two sisters whose names are indecipherable on the title. And it was presented to their brother, J.R. Simcoe, in 1864. Now, this is one of three albums held in the museum. It is one of several books purchased by Annie Lee Brown and her sister Mary Lockyer for the museum in the early 1920s. And it contains some amazing specimens. Now, some citizens took the collecting further by actually doing a scientific identification of the seaweed. And these albums just show how varied seaweed could be. It's not all just the, the large strap-like things that we see on the beach today. You've got Polysiphonia spinulosa, this one, which you'll note is very rare, but it's from Devon. And then we've got Cladostephus verticula, vertic, verticillatus, which comes from Linmouth. And we have the Deliceria russifolia, which I assume means actually red leaves, although they're not leaves. Now, psychology, well, the study of algae was in its infancy as these albums were being compiled. But as the century progressed, one of the most eminent psychologists was a man called William Henry Harvey. And he published the Manual of British Algae in 1841, which at the time was the go-to catalogue for British species. Now, in the introduction, Harvey acknowledges a Mrs. Griffiths twice for spend, sending him specimens. Back in 1817, the Swedish botanist Carl Agard had named a genus of red seaweed Griffithsia in Mrs. Griffiths honour. This is actually one of the species. This is Griffithia devoniensis. In 1846, Phycologica Britannica, Harvey lists several species named after Mrs. Griffiths by various botanists from all around Europe, not just in Britain. In his 1849 popular history of British seaweeds, that would be a seller now, wouldn't it? Um, David Lansborough describes her as the queen of algologists, that's people who study algae. So who was this Mrs. Griffiths? Well, she was one of the most eminent botanists of the early 19th century. In her time, she would have ranked alongside the likes of Charles Darwin and his son Francis, or directors of Kew Gardens like Joseph Hooker and John Lindley. So why have few people heard of her now? Well, it's quite simple probably because she was a woman. This sketch is the only picture I can find of what we believe is Amelia Griffiths, but I'm not actually sure it's her. In 2010, Amelia didn't warrant a mention in the Royal Society's list of influential women scientists that they collected. Perhaps the scientific establishment didn't think seaweed was sufficiently important, but I'm glad to say that view is changing and changing rapidly. Amelia was born Amelia Rogers in 1768 in a little village called Pilton near Barnstable. 
She married the Reverend William Griffiths in 1794, and they moved to Cornwall. But eight years later, her husband died suddenly. So Amelia was left a widow with five young children. But fortunately, she had enough money to remain independent. Amelia decided to leave Cornwall and she moved to Devon, where she actually settled in Ottery St Mary, where she lived for about 20 years. As the nearest beach, and with a thriving community of citizen scientists in the town at the time, I think it's highly likely that Amelia will have collected seaweed on Sidmouth Chip Rocks. But as I said, after about 20, well, 27 years she stayed in Ottery, in 1829, Amelia moved to Torquay, where she could best follow her favourite pursuit of studying seaweeds. To help her out with the house and the family, she employed a housekeeper, Mary Wyatt. And Mary Wyatt was an industrious lady, and eventually she left service and opened a shop selling seashells and pressed plants to visitors. But the two ladies, Amelia and Mary, carried on working together. And they cooperated in seaweed collecting. And they produced two volumes of pressed and named seaweeds found in and near Tor Bay, titled Algae Danmoniensis. This was published in 1893, and each contained 50 different species but most of them were collected and identified by Amelia Griffiths. Later, they produced volumes three and four. Sidmouth Museum is lucky enough to own an 1836 copy of volume four. When this was discovered, I toyed with the idea of buying volumes one, two, and three. And so I looked it up on the internet. Amazon don't do it, of course, but uh, there was a set sold by Christie's in 2002 for six and a half thousand pounds. So I decided that, I wasn't going to donate that to the museum. Now, you'll notice, I say, we know that Amelia collected and named most of the species, but she doesn't appear on the title page. The book is prepared and sold by Mary Wyatt, dealer in shells. This is one of the things, um, Amelia did not, she, cons she was consulted by uh, botanists all around Europe and she gave them lots of advice, lots of them acknowledged her, but she did not publish any um, scientific papers on the, that, largely because ladies couldn't in those days, they wouldn't be accepted in by many of the journals. Anyway, inside the album, each specimen is laid out carefully. Uh, pressing seaweeds is a complex process because they're delicate plants, and actually keeping them in the book. You see, you've got things like little straps of white paper to hold them in. But each of the specimens is labelled quite clearly with what it is um, and where it came from. And there are some strange things in there. This one is called Corda Phylum. And it doesn't live like that. It actually has, exists as a long strap that, grows out dangling across the sea floor. And this one is Enteromorpha erecta, which we might have on our beach. It, we're, I think it's growing on the steps going down to Chip Rock from um, the Millennium Walkway. Uh, but I've got to check that because identifying seaweeds is very difficult. So what are seaweeds? What makes seaweed so special and worthy of study? Why, I said they are important, why are they important? Well, seaweeds are algae, that's primitive plants without true roots, stems or leaves. Now the first photosynthesizing plants evolved in the sea and so they were seaweeds. The earliest fossils that are accepted as being seaweed are actually about one billion years old. So that's a thousand million years old. This one is Manitobia patula. It was laid down in a shallow tropical sea about half a billion years ago. It's found in rock strata in Manitoba. Paleohalidris superba is much younger. That was laid down in the Miocene five to 23 million years ago. This one comes from part of a, this part of a large fossilized kelp forest and off the coast of California. 
And this forest includes fossilized cetaceans. There are dolphins and porpoise skeletons in there. Modern seaweeds are in three distinct groups. There are about 1,700 green species around the world. There are 2,000 brown species around the world. And there are 7,000 red species around the world. Now, the three groups are not closely related at all, but they've evolved with common features to adapt to living on or near the shore. They all have chlorophyll so to photosynthesize, but our seawater is not very clear. And living in deeper, darker waters, growth is limited by the lack of light. Chlorophyll only captures part of the light spectrum, particularly the oranges and reds. It doesn't capture the green part of the spectrum, and that's why we see plants as green, because that light part of the spectrum is just reflected. Orange and red are at the lower energy end of the spectrum and don't have the power to penetrate as deep under the sea as the green light nor the blue light. This makes it difficult for plants to photosynthesize in deep water if they only have chlorophyll. But brown and red seaweeds have other pigments that allow them to capture parts of the light spectrum that reach deeper into the water. Green seaweeds tend to live in shallow water, but the browns and reds can live happily in shallow water, but they can also live happily in much deeper water. Now, unless you're a diver, most of the seaweed you will see lives on the shore and is exposed at low tide. The beach is a hostile place to live, especially if you are a primitive and simple plant that hasn't got complex structures to protect it. You will dry out in the wind and sun when the tide is out, and you'll be battered by the waves when it comes in. Most seaweeds live near or below the low tide line, and so do not have to cope with drying out too much. But some, such as this channel rack, can live close to the high tide line where they're out of the water being dried by wind and sun for hours, for more hours than they spend underwater. Most seaweeds are very flexible and they have a slippery secretion of mucus on their surface to avoid damage from wave action. The seaweeds that we see, as I said, are the intertidal species, but most seaweeds live below the low tide line, so they're out of sight and they are hugely important to the world's ecosystems. In the UK, we have kelp forests offshore along many stretches of our coast. This one is off the Sussex coast. Kelp forests are to coastal seas what the great woodlands are to life on land. For marine organisms, they provide places to live as food and shelter from predators. While for us, they fix a large amount of carbon dioxide and very importantly, they reduce storm damage by absorbing wave energy before it hits the coastline. They also provide food for us directly. Less so in the UK, but seaweed is a huge part of the Asian food market, and the idea is catching on here. Ebb Tides is a local business that is building a market for seaweed products, including for culinary use. They are linked to the dairy shop in Church Street, Seaweeds are at the base of food chains that ultimately generate economically important fish and shellfish stocks that end up on our tables. We wouldn't have beer crab if it wasn't for the seaweed off the shore there. I could do a whole talk on kelp forests, but I can't do that today. That, perhaps that will be next year. To find out more, if you want about kelp forests, I suggest you start with the Sussex Wildlife Trust website because the Trust is embarking on a major project to rejuvenate its offshore kelp forest. Now, the slimy coating that protects seaweed from wave damage contains a number of chemicals that are used to make our life more comfortable. The main ones are sodium alginate, that's E401 on the list of food ingredients, carrageenan, that's E407, and agar agar, which is E406 if it's a foodstuff, but if you've ever worked in a laboratory, it's the jelly that goes in the bottom of the Petri dishes to grow things on. They are actually used as a vegetarian alternative to gelatin. You can find them in marmalade. You can find them in ice cream and cosmetics even. Lipstick has bit seaweed extract in it to 
keep the lips soft and moist. And it's even used to prolong the head on a pint of beer to keep the bubbles stable. I have to say, it wouldn't be the seaweed extract that worries me about the list of ingredients of that um, macaroni cheese that's on the bottom right there. It's a wonderful collection of things that you're eating with processed food. Now, Sussex Wildlife Trust are looking to protect their kelp forest. But kelp farming is becoming a realistic proposition along our coast. It's already happening in the Far East. There are various systems, but the most common is to have ropes seeded with young plants and strung across the sea floor. I believe there are actually people looking into having an offshore kelp farm for Sidmouth. There'll be more news of that later in the year. You might find something out about it in Seafest in a couple of weeks. It'd be worth going to the ham to have a look. But kelp farming, then climate change raises its head. Our sea temperature has risen in the last 150 years. Now, one degree might not seem much, but the change is having a profound effect on what lives around our coast. And kelp is one group being affected. Researchers at Plymouth University are finding that our main south coast forest kelp, which is called Laminaria hyperborea, is actually moving north. And it's being replaced down here along southern coasts by another one, golden kelp. Laminaria ochroluca. Now that's a warm water species that you can find as far south as Morocco. It was first recorded in Plymouth Sound in 1946, but now it's becoming quite common along the south coast. It still has many of the benefits of our traditional kelp forest, but there will be subtle changes in the other species that call the forest home. Hopefully beer crab will still like it. Now, members of the Sid Valley Biodiversity Group, we're trying to survey all sorts of living things around the valley. And we're taking part in a citizen science project being run by the Natural History Museum and the Marine Conservation Society. The Big Seaweed Search is looking for 14 key species to plot changes in our seaweed populations. One section of the study is mapping the spread of non-native seaweed species. I'm sure we all know that the flowering plants like Himalayan balsam and three-cornered garlic are spreading across our valley. And while they are attractive, because that is after all why they were introduced, they are swamping native wildflower populations. Well, as with golden kelp, there are seaweeds that are replacing our native populations. Although they have not been introduced deliberately like the Himalayan balsam was. The spores drift on ocean currents or arrive attached to global shipping traffic. Now in the past, they couldn't gain a foothold on our shore because the water wasn't warm enough, but that is changing. One species in the big seaweed search study is Japanese wireweed, Sargassum muticum. And it is growing on chip rocks. And in actual fact, I went for a walk on the beach last night and some of it had been washed up on the strand line. So it, I don't know how it's been broken up, there haven't been very big waves lately. It's thought that this seaweed didn't come on boats, but was spread around the world attached to Pacific oysters in the 1940s, as the oyster, international oyster trade was changing as natural populations were dying out. And so they were seeding Pacific oysters all over the place. While weed outcompetes other seaweeds, partly by growing quickly, it can grow up to 10 centimetres a day in the summer. And it has air bladders that help it to stay near the surface. And that allows it to shade out other seaweeds below. Japanese wireweed is like a herbaceous perennial. Most of the summer growth is annual and it dies back in the autumn just to leave a perennial core. Now it does provide shelter for a range of small sea creatures and some feed on it but its rapid growth can be a real problem. It can actually clog up harbours being tangled up in the propellers of boats. So apart from wireweed, what does grow on chip rock? Well, in 1836, in his descriptive sketch of Sidmouth, local doctor Theodore Mogridge declares the seashore is rich in algae. And then he lists over 120 species, but this is rather misleading. He's not actually saying what's on the shore, or not describing what's on shore, because his list includes all 
those um, the known species that existed at the time. So I don't know whether he intended to mislead or not, but he wasn't prone to hyperbole, was Mr. Mogridge in his guidebooks. Now his list, interestingly, includes at least five species named after Amelia Griffiths. Now, I don't expect we'll find a hundred species. We have recorded seven of the 14 target species in the seaweed search and 13 different seaweeds in all so far on chip rock, but it's early in the year. Just like our wildflowers, many seaweeds are seasonal and more species will be found as the summer progresses. So what have we got? If we start at the top of the tidal zone, you'll find the green seaweeds in the shallow water. There's sea lettuce, doesn't look terribly appetizing, but it is actually quite often eaten. And it's cousin gutweed, uh, a very, not a very enticing name, but I'm told it's delicious. I'm not actually eating it myself. But the bright green shows that they only have chlorophyll. And so they cannot live in the depleted light in the deeper water. They can only survive near the top of the beach. We've already mentioned channel rack. That's a brown seaweed that can live in deeper water, but it can also cope with the drying of the upper beach area. On a summer's day with a spring tide, when the top of the beach is exposed for up to 10 hours, it will dry to a crisp. But the groove on the underside is full of mucus and that will rehydrate quickly when the tide comes up. Now the racks are the medium sized leathery seaweeds that most people would be familiar with because they grow halfway between high and low tide. And they're exposed during most low tides for at least a few hours. The dominant one on chit, chit rocks and one that is easy to identify is serrated or toothed rack. As the name suggests, the edges of the fronds are serrated with teeth. Now, we didn't find bladder rack, which is a cousin, on the survey day. It has gas filled bladders similar to the wireweed, but I did find some washed up when I was on the beach last night. So it is definitely living on chip rock. We do actually have kelp, which has fronds that are just about accessible and visible if you walk out on an extreme low tide right to the bottom edge of the rocks. But there are three types and it needs careful study to decide which is which. So I need to actually revisit and check the stipe the next time there's an extreme low tide and get down there. I need to check the stipe. That's the stalk of the seaweed because it tells us if it's forest or golden kelp or perhaps it's all weed because each of them have different characteristics. One is very flexible, the other another is hollow and one snaps if you bend it. Much easier to talk, <coughs> sorry, much easier to identify is sugar kelp. And there's plenty of that down there. It's got another name is sea belt. It has long crinkled fronds. There is a similar kelp called dabalox. Some of the names are really <laughs> enchanting, aren't they? Uh, but dabalox has a strong midrib along the frond and we haven't found that yet. I think this one is probably Holmes's rosewood weed. It's translucent sheets of thin, slimy red thallus, and that's all there is to it. It looks to be delicate, but it resists wave damage very easily by being very, very flexible. This one is tiny. There are actually my fingers behind it, to give you an idea of scale, but it's far more robust than roseweed. It's a flat fern weed, but you need a microscope to look at the reproductive cells before you can tell which one it is. There are several filamentous seaweeds on ship rock, but again, you need to look down at very small details to tell them apart. I haven't managed to pin this one down yet. I need to wait until the summer and it comes into its breeding season so I can look at its gonads. Nor this one. There are tangled clumps of it down by the low tide mark. Hopefully I'll be able to identify it fully on the next visit. This one is hairy sandweed. It looks quite spongy on my hand there, but 
And it's not easy to see. It's made up of a filament clothed in whorls of tiny branchlets clinging tight, and that gives it a spongy feel. This is actually reflected in the Latin name, which is Cladostepha spongiosus. Common coral weed is one of the red seed weeds that have a chalky crust that lives on our beat, on our on chip rock. Now it has the chalky crust to protect itself from wave action and for grazing by fish and mollusks. And there are coralline crusts or pink paint weeds, they're called, because they look like they've painted the rocks. These are red seed weeds, again, are hard due to calcification. They encrust rocks, shells, and other seaweeds. Again, you need a microscopic examination of the reproductive organs to identify particular species. <clears throat> now, the chalky seaweeds are included in the seaweed count because they are indicators of a particular problem. I've talked about ocean temperatures rising, but also that there's acid, acidification. As we get more and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, a lot of it is absorbed by the sea. But in the same way as we had acid rain developing, um, as the CO2 dissolves, it increases the acidity of the seawater. And a small change in acidity will cause quite significant damage to the ecosystem. Fortunately, we've got plenty of coralline weeds around our coast on um, Chit Rock at the moment. So it looks like acidification isn't a problem for us at the moment. Now, the survey of chip rocks will continue. If you want to come down and join us, perhaps we'll take a photograph of you all from the back like that. Each month, when an extreme spring tide allows time, right out at the edge of the rock platform, we'll be out enjoying ourselves, being children again, uh, sorry, being citizen scientists again. So as we go into summer, some of the smaller annual seaweeds begin to show and they will be added to the biodiversity groups developing database of local species. So there'll be more reports to come on the biodiversity website later in the year, and we'll be advertising it around. Now, there is a seaweed um, exhibition going to be appearing as part of the museum displays, because the museum is working very hard to display more and more of the stuff and there is a display specifically about the valley's biodiversity. If you've not been to have, go in and have a look, I suggest that you do. And if you're a member of the SBA, of course, it's free to come in, free to go in. And that's all for seaweeds for now, unless people have questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.